Hey gang, it's Steve and I am back with another edition of the Making of Live Fearlessly Diary. I want to talk to you today about guitar parts. I'm very, very happy and pleased to announce that the guitar work on this album will be done exclusively by uh, someone that, that I met, a, well I haven't actually met in person, but we've been in communication many times uh, over the last several years and is someone that I lo have looked up to since I was a little boy. His name is Chris Pinnock, and Chris Pinnock was the lead guitarist in Chicago from 1980 to 1980, uh, early 86. Uh, toured with them and did work in the studio with them, and is credited on albums like Chicago 17 and Chicago 16, which I listened to when I was a little boy. I was born in 1977, uh, Chicago 16 came out in 1982 and it had songs like, here I'll play it loud enough so you can hear it. Say I'm sorry. Very, very famous, big, number one hit uh, comeback song for that group. They had kind of fallen into uh, the cellar for about five years, and that helped lift them back out. And then Chicago '17 was loaded with stuff. You're the inspiration. <laughs> Habit to break. And uh, oh gosh, one of my favorites was a song called Stay the Night. sing as high as Peter Cetera, but, you know. Stay, stay, the night is wrong. Great tune from the 80s, and Along Comes a Woman was another big hit from that one. Uh, I love those. Those are, that came out in 84, so these are some of the very first records I ever remember listening to as a kid, and I was a dork from day one with music. I always read the liner notes. My mom had a great cassette tape collection. She belonged to like, oh, I don't know, is it like Columbia or whatever, Columbia House, where they'd, you'd sign up and you'd get like six or seven albums for a penny, and then they'd send you one a month and for your membership fee, and then you could order other stuff in bulk. So we had a great collection of cassette tapes, especially from the 80s growing up, and Chicago 16 and 17 were some of my very favorites. So I knew the name Chris Pinnock from the time I was like five years old, when I could first read. And, you know, I've had a chance to visit with Chris. He'd be the first to tell you that he's not featured as much on those recordings as he would like to have been, because David Foster was the producer, and David Foster kind of his his M.O. is no matter who he's producing, whether it's a band or whatnot, he brings kind of his own crew in. And um, so he got to do some solo, some guitar solos on some certain songs, but mostly the recordings were done by David Foster's Ringers. But Chris toured the country with Chicago and played those solos and all of those parts on the road with him for the whole time that they had their massive comeback in night from 1982 to 1985 and then Peter Cetera left the group and, and Chris moved on to some other stuff but uh, so he was right there in the thick of all of it and he's more than capable he could easily have been the studio guitarist that's just some producers like to bring in the people they're used to working with so that's just how it goes but 
I'm very, very happy. I've had Chris do some, some demo work for me in the past, and I just contacted him and said, hey, how would you like to do all the work on this new album for mine? He said, absolutely, I'd love to. He's a super nice guy, runs his own studio out in California and does session work and plays on the side and does all kinds of different stuff and, and has lots of friends who have played with lots of people. And so it's just been a great collaboration. And I, it's kind of fun because we're doing it all remote. I create a kind of a, a bass, drum, piano, lead vocal, maybe some strings or whatever recording, and then I send it off to him. I use a, uh, it's called Google Drive, so it's a free thing through Gmail, for those of you who don't know about it. Just try to attach a file bigger than 25 megabytes on a Gmail message, and it'll say, oop, you can't do that as an attachment, but don't worry, we'll let you do it on Google Drive, and you can send stuff up to 10 gigabytes for free just upload it and it sends a download link to the recipient and bada bing bada boom he's able to take my wave file and I make sure that I don't edit out anything at the front so it's all what he gets there's a click in and you know like for a tempo and when he sends his wave back to me his wave file I burn it on a CD and then I can import it right into my digital hard drive recording station and boom so he's been doing as many as two or three or four different guitar parts uh, not necessarily all being played simultaneously but he'll send them to me he'll he'll do something for the verse on one track and then something for the chorus on another track and then he'll do a solo on another track and whatnot and then if I want to I can edit those, I can move them around and consolidate some of them onto one track just so that I can bring the fader up and down and whatnot. But really, really cool. We're doing this remote and it's a little bit like being the director of a motion picture getting your um your score back because you don't really know what it's gonna sound like. You send it off and you hire a con you hire a composer that you trust. You, you sit down, you have meetings with them about the material, and, and then you, you entrust your baby to them and you say, you know, because guess what? <laughs> you don't write music, so <laughs> you don't have time. And if you're the director of a motion picture, you don't have time, even if you did compose music, to, to do that. You've got a thousand other things you're overseeing. And so you wait, and then you're just excited just to hear what they've come up with and how it's going to enhance your movie and, and that's kind of how it is with this as I send it off and uh, Chris just listens to it and thinks up some cool stuff and puts it down and then he'll send me his parts piggybacked onto an mp3 file that I can listen to really quick and if I like what I hear then I say send on the master file and if there's some little tweak that I want to make I say you know, I like this, I like this, but I wonder, could you do this? And, you know, he's right on it. He's a total professional. We're talking about a guy who gets everything done on, like, take one, you know. So he is super, and it is a blast. And I'm so excited by some of the stuff that he's put in. So I thought I'd share a little bit of his work with you and tell you a little bit about who he is and what he's done in the past. And he's worked with Herb Albert and... Uh, Chuck Negrin, who was the lead singer for Three Dog Night, and Chicago, and, and many other many other stuff things. He's he's just an all round great musician. So it's really exciting. I'm glad to have him on the project. This song is called "I Want to Spend My Life with You," and I'm not going to go into what it's all about yet because once the album is released, I'm going to go through and put out videos on each song where I do an acoustic performance and explain the background of the song uh, but I just want to give you some idea I've got drums, bass, piano, strings, lead vocal and guitar now and here's what we've come up with so far
because here's the thing, Chris is a world-class player, so he could be like going all over the place. But the thing is, a great musician doesn't always just use every weapon he's got in his arsenal on every moment. He tries to find the right thing. And he is trying to serve the song, not his ego. Man, I can't even begin to... Great records are made by people who put the song first. Every time, that's what makes a great record. Not your ego, the song. Lindsey Buckingham from uh, Fleetwood Mac, I love this quote. He was talking about um, how he, everything that he plays is about the song, first and foremost. You know, He said, there's a lot of things that I can do, but I don't necessarily do them because I... There's always got to be a smell test for, for him about how is it making the song better to do this or is it just a cool lick? And that's what I love about Chris's work is he's always doing something to enhance the song. Because at that point, you don't want to get in the way of the lyric. You don't want to get in the way of the story happening here. You want to hear what's being said. So he's just got these nice kind of... I mean, you know, it's genius in its simplicity. And I love that. I love working with a guy. I love working with anybody who has the prowess to do all kinds of things. But the state of mind to dial it back when it needs to be dialed back. That's when you know you're really working with a great musician. It isn't about what you can do. It's about... It's about your judgment about what to do in any given situation. And then, you know, I hope I'm following his lead. On that piano part, I'm just doing something very simple. Oops. Forgot I've got that up really, really loud. I'm going. Again, we're trying to create an effect where the, the backing track kind of floats along and the focus is front and center, not so much on my vocal for the vocal, but you want to hear what's being said. You know, this is a song, a story, if you will. So, anyway, that's kind of what's happening there. Put a little bit of power underneath there, just bang, bang. I'll turn it up a little bit so you can hear it. It'll be out of balance, but I want you to hear what he's doing there. And the reason I wanted that is that. To me, this song, it's like, I, I didn't write it necessarily to be an 80s power ballad, but it's like, it kind of is. kind of belongs on an Ario Speedwagon or a Journey or a, you know, Chicago 17. The only thing I didn't do to complete the circles, I didn't do it on this voice, I didn't play... acoustic piano because I didn't want it to sound too 80s but you know it was I just needed a little bit of power underneath that on the bass and man it just adds some intensity I love the effect that creates the only thing I
got him and I've got him doubling that. I've got that little string line happening. And he's just got that great uh, that great kind of clean it's not really distorted. It's kind of a nice clean uh, rock tone. the doubling because you know if it's just strings doing it it's a little bit unfocused if it's just guitar doing it it gets a little bit harsh for the the tune but the two together you get that little bit of edge and that softness over there and it balances out into this great timbre it's just oh I'm just I can't even tell you how excited I am and, and everything that he sent me he sent me I've got work now from him on he sent me two new ones, and then I'm using work that he already did for me a few years ago on three other songs that's just fabulous. And I'm going to send him two more to work on next week, and a couple more the week after that, and we'll be pretty close to, to being done. I think that'll actually wrap the entire project, but um, man, it's cool. It is so cool. It, it would be cooler if I could work with him in the room. Uh, and, you know, he's not that far away. He's in California. But, you know, it's just cost prohibitive. But holy cow, isn't it amazing to live in this day and age where I can do a record of this quality out of my freaking guest room with my own little studio here and have a world-class musician like Chris Pinnock do work for me and do it all over the computer and it's affordable and, and he does all right and I do all right on it. I mean, it is... God bless the information age. I know that a lot of people follow the meme that the music industry has been destroyed by the information age, but I, I personally don't think so. I think that we're we're sorting out how to replace the revenue streams and some laws are gonna have to be changed, but not laws that restrict access, laws that make it easier to license. I think the main thing that's gonna have to happen is it's gonna have to be more affordable and more user friendly to legally use other people's stuff so that there can be a revenue stream, a copyright revenue stream happening. Um, because, you know, for instance, it, why pirate, you know, why steal a song when it only costs 99 cents to download? You know, there's not as much just out and out theft happening as there was when they first started this thing and people were reluctant to put their music up on iTunes or whatever. But now iTunes is doing it and Amazon's doing it and all these other sites are selling the music and it's affordable and it's like, hey, you know, why screw with why screw with doing something illegal when it's so easy and affordable to do it legally and it's in the infrastructure, the the you know, the MP3 player syncs up so beautifully to this and that, whereas if you steal a file it's harder to integrated into your system. So as they get better at that, I think we will find a way, because there's still a desire to consume music. So, but I'll tell you what, there's an awful lot more power and an awful lot more opportunities in the hands of people like me who aren't signed with a major label to do something and actually reach some people with it today and to not go bankrupt trying to do it. I mean, the first album I made, Time for the Show, my God, I had to do that in a studio. I, it, the thing, it cost me like $5,000 to make it, or four. It cost me about $4,000 to make it. I did it on a shoestring. I didn't even have guitar on that album because I couldn't. <laughs> couldn't afford it, <laughs> you know? would have been another $1,000 by the time I did all of the you know, by the time I paid for the session work, or at least another 500, and I just couldn't. And then I had to order a thousand copies of it, you know. I mean, it was just very, very cost prohibitive to do that. And there was no way for me at the time to really recoup my money, let alone turn a profit on it. But on this, now that I've got a global audience, albeit not as big as I'd like it to be, but I can put this stuff out digitally, it'll be there forever and available for people to buy, so I can make money on it for years to come, I never run out, I can use a print-on-demand source and get maybe a hundred copies done physically, 
that look nice and then I can reorder again down the road if I need to but have it available digitally keeps the overhead low I do the recording out of my home I can actually work with someone without having to get them in the room with me and that's more hours that it would cost blah 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 the overheads way 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 lower so I can make this album which is going to be a far superior record I think to, to the time for the show for I don't know. I bet the whole thing is going to cost me less than $1,000 total. Obviously, I had to buy this equipment, but I would have had this equipment anyway. And this stuff, hell, you can buy a pretty darn good studio for your house for a grand, maybe a couple grand, and then have it and use it for a decade, 15 years. So it's really, really amazing. I am very grateful to be a musician in this day and age. All the challenges that exist, I understand why people talk about it, but I think it's a real blessing to be a musician in this day and age. And I think the more people start focusing on what's wonderful about being a musician right now, and less about what's changed from, and I know you're saying, well, you're the one who wrote a song called Bring Back the 70s. Well. But I'm not actually saying that I want the 70s to be back. I'm just saying I really enjoyed the radio. I, I loved the variety of music that was on the radio at that time. But I wouldn't trade the, the business environment of today for that. Not, not by a long shot. Because it was pretty hard to be independent back then. So anyway, the more we focus on what's great about this, the more solutions will present themselves to us so that we can actually... Everyone can make a living again, you know, and and there's not going to be such blatant, crazy, you know, copyright infringement going on all the time because there will be some way eventually for us to not, to not infringe, to actually pay a licensing fee that's reasonable, you know, that's uh, appropriate for the amount of exposure that's, that it's getting. So... Anyway, that's my little rant about this, but I'm just saying I'm I'm thrilled because this is a great artistic release for me, and I actually think that I will make money on this project, you know, and I'm an entrepreneur, and that counts too, and uh, that's not that wouldn't necessarily be the case if it cost me five thousand dollars to do it. So, I'm very very excited. <laughs> And I'm really, really excited to share Chris Pinnock's work with you, along with uh, the songs that I've worked really hard on over these years. And um, it's coming together. It's really coming together. It's, um, it's fun. So that's what I've been up to. I'll do a video here in a, again in a few days, probably, about uh, putting piano parts down and talk a little bit about that, expose you to some bits and pieces of some other songs. Probably hear a few more of Chris's licks, too. And then uh, we're coming up pretty soon. It won't be that long before this album is done and released. And then I'll start breaking down each one of the songs for you and telling you about that, how I wrote it. And we'll do some performance videos of those and, and whatnot. It's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you for joining me on this journey. It's been fun to share what's going on as I do it and uh, I'll keep you posted we'll talk a little bit about doing vocals and things too so very cool I will be in touch with you again soon and remember if you're not having fun when you're making music you're doing it wrong I'm Steve Lundgren and I'll see you on the next one <laughs>